What I thought is to um, contextualize the milieu out of which Layla came, which is uh, a reflection on the human rights aspects that I think really reflect in her work. And I was just wondering out of all of you here, so that we're not redundant, who of you are very familiar with the climate for LGBT people in Uganda, say starting around 2010, 2011, through 20, through now? You, you're not familiar? Okay, so then I think contextualizing it is going to be helpful. So I thought I would do that and then um, reflect on, um, you know, Leila will talk about her experience and then we'll, we'll get into a discussion about it and how her art impacts that. I think I cannot overstate Leila's importance um, as an artist in the diaspora. She's unique and what her art reflects when you hear <coughs> the context um, might help understand more why she is so significant and so important. And getting this kind of exposure um, and being able to share her work and you know, do what activism art's supposed to do, create the visibility, is actually critical to so many, probably millions of people. And I think when I give the context, it will explain more why. So in um, many, you know, century or two ago, the um, the English, the uh, Belgians, the Portuguese, the Germans, they all, the Spanish, everybody tootled off to Africa and colonized. And at that time, sexuality within, I mean, Africa is full of different tribes with different cultures and different traditions. But a pretty much a common denominator and a common thread was nobody really cared about sexuality the way people in the West did in terms of curving it, and I think that had a lot to do with religion. I'm really oversimplifying this. But in particular, in Uganda and many other countries, there are 32 countries that criminalize homosexuality, criminalize all LGBT people, 32 out of 54 African countries, two have just recently decriminalized, in Angola and Botswana. Um, but it was the penal codes that the colonialists introduced when they came and they saw that people were living and didn't care about how they related in terms of sexuality, to them it was quite an abomination and so they threw their penal codes and the irony is now, it should we call it the West, well in most countries we've got rid of those criminalizing penal codes and we even have marriage equality and other forms of LGBT equality in these countries but we left behind that colonial stain. And the greatest irony of all this is that when you talk to people in those countries, like to the government of Museveni in Uganda, they will say that homosexuality is un-African and that homosexuality is a Western import. So it totally ignores how they really in reality got there. And to me, from what I've seen, um, what Layla came out of and what she's able to express with African expression serves to be that voice through its visibility that negates so much of this dicta that is so incorrect that we're hearing. And that's a very simple way of saying why I think that she is so important in, in this picture. In 20, around 2010, 2011, the American evangelicals went to Uganda. And it included people like Scott Lively, who actually ran for governor in Massachusetts, I think it was. Um, and they said to the Ugandans, and I'm oversimplifying again, hey, your penal code doesn't punish these guys enough. You really need to have a death penalty. You really need to put people away for life. And so they came up with this idea, they hooked up with a politician by the name of David Baharty, and he introduced a bill, a private member's bill, into the Ugandan parliament called the Anti-Homosexuality Bill, which was dubbed the Kill the Gays Bill. And we got a lot of publicity about that here. 
and uh, a lot of the LGBT community from around the world were up in arms. And the kind of pushback we did, like boycott, uh, don't be tourists there, all that kind of thing really serves to backlash on the gay people because it's coming from a Western voice. Again, within that context, art and visibility in the diaspora speaks a different speak. So the anti-homosexuality bill was used as a ping pong ball, uh, ball between the politicians as a way to uplift them because the, about 98% of Ugandans favored the Kill the Gays bill. And the politicians connect through religion and the religious people, they all got together and it became this thing that bound people across political lines. Scapegoating, something typical that we're very used to here as LGBT people. So the more we pushed back from the left, Obama came in on it, everybody made their comments, it, the more the pushback on that side was, we're a sovereign country, you can't tell us what to do, we're going to make this bill happen. Long story short, they passed the bill in December of 2013. Museveni, the dictator president of Uganda, who's now been in office for over 30 years, signed the bill into law. And the bill became law in February 2014. And then the very brave and courageous activists pushed against it. And the bill was actually found to be unconstitutional because, not on the merits of the bill, but because parliament never followed the proper protocol of having a proper quorum when it was voted for. So the bill no longer exists, but a lot of people in Angola think that those laws still apply. And that's caused a tremendous amount of persecution. What happened with Leila is, and she will, will speak to this further, is that um, the minutes Museveni signed the bill, Leila and other activists on the ground and other LGBT community were pictures and articles were written about them in the equivalent in uh, a couple of magazines that had enormous widespread sale on the streets. And these, the headlines were hang them, the headlines were Uganda's biggest hundred homos. I was actually in it. Was I in the same one as you? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think so. Uh, Rebecca, Rebecca has it here. Yeah. 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 I was, I, yeah, because I had been in talks with the Hearty and I'd been involved and, you know, I, I was the only white person, I think, in that entire magazine. And what they said about me was very complimentary. But I could wear that badge with honor. But people in Uganda who woke up one morning, his parents might not ever have known that their, their kid was a lesbian, bisexual, or gay, who suddenly employers. Uh, teachers, doctors, professionals. And the, the most damning thing about that was everybody was under the impression, I'm not going to go into the intricacies of it, but everybody was under the impression that if you did, under the new bill, that if you did not report a known gay within 48 hours, you could go to jail for four years. So you can just imagine the panic, the chaos, people leaving, and then maybe you can talk to how you came out of that. So that's the context and, and the, the politicization of it, etc. I mean, you got here. All right, uh, thank you so much, Mela, and thank you everybody who's here to listen. And I'm so honored and I highly respect you so much because you give giving all my history away. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, what is very important about your work is you read and you really read and followed everything from the one who you know the dates, you know everything. Uh, at 2013, I was in London and then I had to come back home. I was in a at residence, but um, as I always say, uh, my family have just been doing my thing and just them, they just don't care about how much lesbian I am. Though it was just, they don't care. We don't talk about it. But when you talk about the tabloids, uh, 2014, I remember I just come back home and uh, an anti-homosexuality bill had passed. And then the next day, actually, what really sparked my father to be so mad at me was the tabloids. Uh, he didn't get the tabloid like after a week. I was uh, not home by then. And uh, one of his friends brought the tabloids to him and was like, 
and then he's like, okay, this I can't hold, this I can't handle. So that is how I started I was breaking up with my father. And uh, the next thing, I was in court with Stella Nyanzi. And uh, instead of saying, well, well, actually it was a very big headline in Uganda, local news. Homosexuals trying to fight for their rights. And guess who? My first... <laughs> I was in court and oh, my father is seated in the living room watching news. He's like, I would pretend that I didn't see the newspapers. I would pretend I don't watch English news. But this is on a local tablet, on local TV, local language. Everybody's watching this. The next day, I don't know how he got to this and we never talked about it. I'm not at home as an art residence um, within the country. The next day, my sister calls me. Where are you? I'm like, I'm in an art residence, I direct her where I am, and what happens? She came with a very long letter from my father. I'm like, okay, this has just begun. It, we literally never talked about it. He never called me about it. He, we never talked about it. But what, what my siblings are like, he saw you, besides the tablets, brought to him straight to the house, he saw you on TV. We don't know how you're going to tell him how you now into your gay issues and all over TV because he's a Muslim judge. He's like among the top guys in, in the Muslim community. So now it's, it's about, uh, you know, he's like, okay, I've been, I used to drive him around when he's home. And, uh, the routine was I always put on my pants because the Muslim culture they don't. Women have to dress up like long dresses, long. You have to veil all the time. But I was an ex exceptional because I'm an artist, and I'll be like, how am I gonna dress up long skirts and long whatever when I have to go to school? I don't have to keep on changing. So we had we had our own thing. Me and my father and my siblings. Where when we have, we are, when I have to drive him to the mosque. I had this one typical skirt that I always put on. It was always in the car. Mm -hmm. It's like, we are meeting my friends. And then I put on the, the veil. So it was in a relationship that we never talked about. But now it's getting into the tabloid. It's getting onto the social, on television. So this is our broker. And he sent me this big letter denouncing me. I have a twin sister who carried this letter to me. I'm like, OK, who is, who is, who is? So, so we are twins. My father says he's no longer my father, but he's still your father. So we started laughing about it. Mm -hmm. At first I was so mad, but then it is like, he would have denounced my sister too, because how do you denounce one kid and be twins? So we started laughing about it and you know, just saying, he's maybe becoming old. But um, it didn't stop there because at that time, I was in an art residence, I had space to stay. And now I'm like, okay, I can't go back home from here, so what do I do? And this is the time when all the transgender boys, that is why all my works have transgender and, uh, you know, kinky boys, you know. That is the love that I really have for them. That is where it started from. They start calling me daddy. Because, you know, they call me daddy, they call me that. Daddy, we need help. That, everybody was panicking. I remember. Everybody that. was seriously panicking. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I tell them, you know what we should do? Come to my room. And I just have this single room in my art residence. Um, so they come in. I'm like, I'm not supposed to post anybody, but I'm like, just come in quietly. Don't tell anybody, don't talk, don't. So I hide them in here. And then started calling different organizations. I'm like, I need help. First way, I'm not supposed to house anybody. And uh, so that is how we started. And the director, who is lesbian and actually married recently, was a good friend of mine. But she typically, because of the government rules and everything, everybody was panicking. I'm on CNN. She's Googling. She's from Britain. She's, on, she's reading whatever she's reading. She calls me. She's like, this is where we're ending at. Yeah. You're on CNN with your you know, activism and being one of the gay people here. And we're housing you, we're giving you 24 hours to leave. I'm like, then this is serious. Yeah. It, was, it was a tough time, yeah. but... Uh, 
And then after that, um, I, never talked about, I never talked about this anywhere. You bring back all this, you know. <laughs> this is, you know, I think this is important in your art because um, <laughs> I never talked about you're this. You're an ambassador for this on so many different levels, and and and, so, and some of it, you know, to me because I have such uh, depth of vision into what's gone on, it's really interesting in its reflections because you know, let's add another dimension to this, and we'll come back to you in. Yeah. in how you got here and, and what happened there because I think that's really important. But what's so interesting to me, I, people in the art world may or may not realize this, and I don't profess to be an expert at all, but I have collected African art my whole life. Being from South Africa, I would see people's work and I would fall in love with it and I would bring it and then there, there was this whole, there's this new aspect now where people are claiming that art that's made its way to the West, that's, we always thought of African art as the tribal art that was used in ritual. That's what made it valuable. Less so of, more recent is the, the modern contemporary art. But the, the old ritualistic art is what the collectors always used to collect. And now there's this big movement to send it back. This is cultural, uh, culturally owned. We just, these we colonialists just took it now, let's go back. It's within this kind of context that I think there's a new stage developing and I feel like there's so much going on in Africa from Rwanda's um, uh, genocide and all the, and even in film, Rafiki, the film Rafiki and what you're doing, there's this whole platform right now for expressing contemporary, contemporaneously what's going on and how we here can look at things differently and educate ourselves so that we don't go back there as the bombastic colonialists that we've always been. So the voice in the diaspora of someone like um, Layla is so critical. I'm back to that. But let's get back to, so, so you got a rest, how you, uh, so, so before we do that, there were hundreds, hundreds, this is why she's so important as well. There were hundreds of people <coughs> contacting me by the minute, panicking, that all of them couldn't fit in her room. It was, a, it was a serious one. How are we going to get out of here? Where are we going to go? America's not giving us visas. Should we go to Kenya and become refugees with UNHCR? And this is still playing out today in 2020 as we speak. What started then is still playing out, and we have a huge migration of LGBT people right now caught up in the most terrible of circumstances at Kakuma Camp in Kenya, um, there were very few that managed to get out on visas and different to refugees are asylum seekers. The asylum seeker arrives as a visitor or an artist and residence or as a business person and once they are in America, then they say, I can't go back to my country, I'm in too much danger, I want asylum. And she came in on that basis and you can speak more to that. Yeah, so um, interesting because I have a long story to catch yours. <laughs> I'm glad we're not showing uh, all this much art on the PowerPoint. Uh, and today it's about Leila and then bringing up all the history. There are just, uh, things that I've never talked about and things that you feel like they passed. You passed through over them. Like that incident, I've never said it anywhere where I had to house all these boys in my house and then call, call you know, different organizations and telling them I'm also given 24 hours to leave this place. Uh, because the director now finally comes and tells me, you know, we are friends and you can put our organization on danger if you go out there and scream about it on social media. If you, you know, so I kind of started looking to a traffic. Well, I've been given this opportunity to come to a residence. The owner is a so gay person. And uh, I first was so furious about her because I'm like, that we need this organization in Uganda because it's an organization that helps many artists to come and you know practice art, and we kind of also give them and an, um, help you know uh, help them to go out on an international platform. So they kind of help artists in their art residences. So I said, if I don't think twice, I might screw it up for other young artists. So that is how I never talk about that anywhere. But when you bring in about how now I start raising money to send this, I typically send 
like 10 of them to Kakuma camp because that was the only solution. And I never knew about the camp. But uh, they were telling me, oh, we can go to Nairobi. And I'm like, what are, we going to, what are you guys going to do in Nairobi? They're like, we have friends out there. So the only way is, was like, just raise 80,000, which is like 80,000 will be like less than six, less than $25. So I get them 80,000 whenever I got in any hall I was on social media, I'm like calling friends, like they were sending me money. So I kind of, you know, split the money. Most of them left. But I didn't know where typically they were living, but it was about right now living for safety. But I didn't know that there was a camp anywhere. Yeah. They were just saying, we have friends in Nairobi who can house us. So it was about, right now it's about living. And, just getting uh, out of there. Yes, and I remember one of them calls me late in the night. Uh, she's actually now fully transformed. She's like done her surgeries and all that. She came, she, she, he called me. Daddy, I'm right here in the middle of the market. I'm like, where exactly? He mentions the name, I'm like, that is super dangerous. Can you hop onto a border border, please? So he jumps on onto a motorcycle. He came to me and I'm like, okay, you're gonna sleep here tonight. Then tomorrow morning, see what we can do. He's, he's really successful right now. He's, he's transformed, beautiful woman and doing power. That is why I love so much working with transgender women because of that small history. And uh, how do I, I finally, because they had a small house somewhere, kind of building, but not yet done, finished, finished. So I had to get up from that place and then go there, which is away from the city. And I remember the most <coughs> interesting part, we are now invited as activists. There was a party with one of them leading, or one of us friends leading. The patron was just a transgender woman. And uh, were invited, but were still under panic. I remember dressing up, I was supposed to that that photo, it's one photo when I was like fully dressed up like this serious woman, putting on high heels, and I come to the party and everybody's like, that never seen me in a dress. But you know, we're all putting on dresses, the cashiers, everybody was like, to escape, that is the only way you had to dress up. And you know, our transgender boys also had to like put on jackets, dress up like boys, you know, which was also very interesting. And uh, Which we're still going through. We still, so many yes. people are still going through yeah. having to hide who they are and, what, you know. Speak to how when you came here to Fire Island and your experience here. Yeah, so now I'm, I'm at home and typically this idea of, well, I've gone into a residence in London and they know how it really works. And uh, one of my boys now is in Nairobi. He's, because for the first team that went to Nairobi, everything was really easy for them. They kind of were helped easily. So he calls me, he's like, Daddy, guess what? Instead of being in Uganda, can you also come to the camp? I'm like, tell me about the camp. So he tells me everything about the camp. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm better than that. I'll apply for a natural residence. And guess what? I put online, get at residences. I started applying different residences and then I ran into Fire Island at residence and they called me, uh, Chris Borgia, I'm like, you're among the five artists selected. I'm like, okay, so how do I get there? So they walked up everything and then I'm going to explain. And, and given, um, yeah. given how hard it was for people to get out of there, this was a miracle. Yes. This was a miracle. Very interesting story to cut short. I now go to Fire Island. First week, I refused to get out of the house because it's crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. So you just imagine you're, you're off the plane and the next destination is Fire Island. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're hiding yourself because you're in a tabloid and now you can walk in the street and nobody cares. Uh, you're yeah. talking about caring? These men come naked. Yeah. Yeah. They want to see a person from Africa like, oh, she's an activist from Africa. They will come in with love. And I'm like, it's coming. And then naked. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I literally am like, this is crazy. And I thought everybody in America, to me, to me, I thought that is America. And I had to get used to America, you know. I have this friend who really loves my work. Uh, he's called uh, Michael, Bruce Michael. He has a he has a ring on his cock. I'm like, he's like coming here with a big stuff. And I'm like, I was so out of it. So then, interestingly, 
when you apply for asylum, I'm trying to sort of integrate the difficulty, because she, she's modest about the difficulty she's gone through. She's, she's such an optimist and, you know, and, and, and she, she reflects that in her, her work. Um, but I want to say this real quick. When you come for asylum in America, you know, you only, obviously she only got a certain amount, was only able to get a certain amount out of her, um, what she was doing as, a res as an artist in residence and nobody knew who she was. Um, but you really do, to, as an asylum seeker, you don't get any government money, any government help. We, post what she went through is the Donald Trump era. So you, whatever I tell you, since she was here in 2015, what happened after 2016 was times 10 worse. Everything was worse without going into the details. But when you arrive, you're not allowed, and you apply for asylum, what do you need? You need a lawyer who can put your case forth so that you don't get kicked out and deported. You need a proper case. Number two, you need expert witness testimony as to the country conditions. That's what I do. I do appear in the American courts as a country conditions expert for to give testimony in the courts for people getting asylum. And that's where African HRC and I was able to work with Layla on that. Um, number three, you need money to live. You need a place to sleep. You need food to eat. But there's not a single program out there for you as an asylum seeker. As a refugee, there's because you're coming through UNHCR. But as an asylum seeker, which is where she was, no status, you've got absolutely nothing. And when you put that application in, first of all, from the moment you step foot and decide you want asylum, a, a prominent organization like ours will probably take three months to find you a pro bono lawyer who will represent you for free. Because you it's probably twenty thousand dollars worth of work and you can't do it. My work Country conditions reports are about $4,500 a piece, all pro bono. We can't charge asylum seekers for that. So there's all this resource effort going into doing the stuff that people can't afford. The minute, so it takes about four or five months for the application to go in. You can only get a work permit six months after your application has gone in. So you can imagine how needy you are. Out of all the asylum seekers I've worked with, I have never ever made somebody as resourceful as Layla, and I don't say that lightly. Layla never ever, Layla always sought out her own solutions. And so much of that solution seemed to present from her art on some level. We were able to work together and find people whose couches you were able to go on couch served trying to get food, trying to get service. It was tough. It was really, really tough. And all that time, you were doing your art. Exactly. All that time, you found a space, and you found a way, and you were doing that art. And that's why this art just carries so much of you, because of what you were going through, that so many people, you, didn't, you kept it to yourself, that so many people never saw, or even began to understand. There was even exploitation from within our own community of people who said, well, if you're going to sleep on my couch, then you need to look after my children and I'm not paying you minimum wage, whatever it might have been. There was a lot of stuff that Layla went through that some of us might not necessarily approve. But at the same time, we were grateful for. Yeah. You know, there was still gratitude. So that's the context, right? Yeah. Um, I'm going to go a little bit about things that we, today we just have a small, you know, back and forth history and a little, you know, pitch of things that I never talked about. I remember when I was at Fire Island, the first thing I'm like, how do I stay here? So I told another man, and she's like, the first thing you need is a phone. Is a what? A phone. <laughs> if you have a phone, then we can now communicate back and forth. Because me, I thought, I'm in America, wherever I was, I thought that was the entire USA. So she's telling me no. I call a few folks already here. But I never realized what it means and how big America is. Because I call, I call one of the boys and he's in Atlanta. And he's like, I can't really help you. Where are you? I'm like, I'm in New York. I'm like, I serve these kids. They can't serve me because they're in Atlanta. They can't jump onto the bus. Because in Kampala, Kampala is, you wouldn't, you wouldn't pick a plane to go in a certain place in Kampala. It's all buses. And you know, six hours, that will be the longest not the strip it within the within the country. So I'm like, they can't help me out. I call everybody, I call Jones. I'm in Boston. 
you're in New York, and it's until today I kind of realized that yes, somebody can call you and they're really stranded, and they're stranded and you can't help them because of the location. You can't help, you, you, you get a lot of people, and somebody's like, where are you? Like the person recently you told me to help. Yeah, they were on the southern border. The southern border, mm -hmm. somebody calls you and I've just landed here, I'm actually being caught. At the we, we had your help with translation. We're translating, they don't know English. And you can't even drive down there. You, you really want to help them, you know. So I got into that, and uh, it was a serious one, but I'm glad that, you know, things worked out. I'm, I'm like, always on it, I'm like. And uh, I, you introduced me to African Services Committee, which is very helpful and really helped. Because I remember by that time they had a very small fund that they used to give to asylum seekers. That is why I was like, in case, you know, maybe in the future, like, and I've discussed it with my lawyer like, by then, or legal advisor, I'm like, or anytime I sell artwork, I feel like I need to give back to such organization because I typically had nothing, but they would give me a card of $350 a month just to have, you know, food, which is very interesting and I never took for granted at all. Because you come here, you typically have nothing. Mm -hmm. Like I came on the plane, I remember I was, I was discussing with one of uh, the folks on dinner and I was telling them when I came to the US, I only had $20. And that $20 almost tapped me at the airport. And they were asking me, how much money do you have? I'm like, I have $20. And I was serious about it because I had $20. And at $20 at home is a lot of money because I knew I have $20. I'll have a cup of coffee, I'll have lunch, I can use some transport on my $20. They typically ask me, how much money do you have? I'm like, seriously, $20. And then to me by then, $20, I thought it's a lot of money. And that is why I'm so serious about it. But um, just having $350 every single time on your card until you get a work authorization, that is a big deal. And I always feel in debt of such organizations. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that the world is in debt to you because you have used your talent and your resources and you're doing it right now. And I feel like this, being on the West Coast and right here at this particular gallery, for example, is a somewhat of a rebirth on it, in, in and of itself because of the visibility that you bring and your not only your story, but how it reflects in your work. Um, uh, and, you know, I have just one more question that I want to ask you, and then maybe somebody in the audience would like to dialogue or ask a question. But um, the, the, the one thing that I, that I was kind of interested in, me personally, so forgive the question, is how, you know, how Americans are looking at your art and buying your art and, um, and just, you know, trying to understand your art. From what you have produced here, how do you think the people in Uganda, if some of these pieces were there, how it would be received? Um, besides uh, most of my my uh, drawings, which I basic, I, I typically want to put a lot of. Um, realism in them, even when they're not like realistic photos. I would draw these photos of a typical boy putting on lipstick, putting on earrings. This is what I want to communicate because this to me is very important that transgender people are um, um, the face of the LGBTI community. If you just want found a, a male gay man and he didn't tell you they're gay, then you wouldn't know they're gay. If you just phone me tomorrow morning putting on a dress and don't tell you I'm a lesbian, you wouldn't know. But typically transgender people, it doesn't matter if they tell you or if they don't tell you who they are. So uh, that is why I typically do that in my works. And uh, before, I don't think they would exhibit my work at all. Yeah. And uh, right now, a little bit, maybe a 10%, they would kind of relate to it as, uh, you know, Comedians, because comedians always go away with a lot of things. And uh, like I have some of the pieces that are in the small room. Mm -hmm. I looked at one of the comedians, actually she's holding the microphone. They are highly welcomed. So to me, I think they would put it in that perspective. 
when you look at uh, Kim Love, people take him as a, a, a um, comedian. He comes out and says, I'm a woman, I have a vagina. And people are like, he's a comedian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they, and typically they follow him and he has a lot of followers. But this is also another way of, uh, you know, being an activist and he's right. strongly about it. He's been on many uh, uh, open girls and uh, performances and he typically comes in elegantly dressed like a woman with all his beard and you know, people don't take him like super serious but he's serious about his work. And then again, we can't not forget Mama Stella Nyanzi. Exactly. Now Stella Nyanzi is a very well known, she was a professor at a the big university there. She's serving 15 months in the Uganda prison. She served 15 months so far. I don't know how long her, her term is. What did she do? She wrote a poem criticizing Museveni, who's the dictator president of, of Uganda. And in the poem, she used his mother's vagina in a metaphor, metaphorically. And she's serving time. So this is the kind of oppressive, and, and, and a brilliant woman, yeah. and an activist of, in her own right, and an artist, you know. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, before that, let me yeah. talk, yeah. that was about painting. Yeah, sorry. Was, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, let me now talk about how people would work on my sculptures at all. Uh, I have a strong belief, and I've been doing a lot of research, about homosexuality and the history of homosexuality. I typically started from the Ugandan community or from Uganda as a country because we have history. If, if, we, if we didn't have history of homosexuality, we didn't, we, there wouldn't be names attached to actions of homosexuality. So that is how I started looking at homosexuality. And I realized, you know, it, it's been in the kingdom. Buganda. Exactly. Buganda. Buganda. And I come from the Buganda kingdom. And uh, the only way I can tell people, yes, it is homosexuality, it is what it is. People have been respecting it from, a, from all aspects of traditions. So I look at the queens and kings in my work and they kind of flip the names. Let's assume I'll just get one of my transgender sculpture and give it King Monga. Like I have Sangali Angogo who is the daughter of the queen, the daughter of the king, and then I'll just put all this masculine sculpture and give it. So, I, and at times to me I feel like when I've heard that People talk about my work and they're like, but why do you call this one a girl name and this one a boy name, more especially from the king or from the royals? That sparks me up because this is what I want people to understand. Because people relate so much to the royals. I'm not going to call my father's name my name and people will, it, it will be just, you know, okay, she's... It's, it won't be taken serious, but in the king version, it's taken serious. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at Nigeria, when you look at the Igabo, the Igabo community and tradition where women are supposed to work, it is okay to marry a woman. Women marry women because of certain reasons in the community, in their tradition, trade, attach things to it. When you look at Middle East, when you look at the Mujeres, you know, in Mexico, where you know the boy is born in a girl body and the treasure, the, 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 their fathers actually, they have a very interesting story. Their fathers don't like them. They own, they're only loved by their mothers. So that is the spark of my sculptures and uh, you know, relating it to our history because we have a history that is, is, was formed there by people like Scott Lively and people relate to it. Yeah. That's it. Bless you. So anybody want to ask any questions or bring in a topic or I would just love to know what, what we can do and what you think are the most important organizations on the ground that we can support. And, and I'm, I'm, you know. Let me tell you, let me tell you what we're going through. Um, her path is um, not quite, to, I mean there are a lot of people coming on her path. So they hear the different paths and here's where you can help. First of all, just being here, you're helping you know, in, in willing to be in this kind of conversation. Talking about that's helping. My organization, African HRC, work, my, I work a 40 hour volunteer week. I don't get paid because there's no operational funding. 
So we struggle, but we do, we're very aligned. Um, we're, we're helping UNHCR. UN, UNHCR does not have um, enough of what it needs. It has 16 million migrants worldwide. We have 700 LGBT refugees right now in Kenya who are not being properly taken care of. I'll give you my card and you can read the stories of what's happened just from December 21 to today. Board members on my organization gave their own money to feed people that were stranded outside a gate because UNHCR closed down for the holiday and these people had been given huts in Kakuma camp. They have to be in Kakuma camp because Kenya has an encampment policy for all refugees due to the terrorism that's going on in Kenya right now. LG, imagine this, imagine being a bank robber in Uganda. Because if you're gay and you're criminalized, you're like a bank robber, right? Imagine being a bank robber in Uganda where it's illegal to be a bank robber. And then going to Kenya for safety, but you're also a bank robber in Kenya. Well, if you're criminalized as gay in Uganda, and you go over to Kenya, which is the only place you can go to, to hook up with UNHCR, to try and get resettled globally, you arriving to a hostile host country who's supposed to protect you as a refugee because you're also a criminal in their country. This is what we're tackling right now. So there's a lot of homophobia. They get beaten up by police. The victim to an attack, a police an attack when they go to the police in Kenya, the, Kenya, the Kenyan police will take the side of the perpetrator and not the victim. This is what we're up against. We're in talks with UNHCR daily. We have a new advisory on our website. We are well respected by the refugee side and we're well respected by the um, UNHCR side. And we're trying to bridge gaps and we're trying to come up with solutions. Um, cutting an enormously complex situation short. So what we need is we need resources so that we can feed people when they are in limbo, which is what we've been doing. We need resources so that we can feed asylum seekers when they come here and they haven't had time to put in their application. Trump's done a little bit things a little bit differently. What he's now doing is from the minute you apply for your asylum, he will hear the new cases first, not the old cases. Why is he doing that? Because he doesn't want to give you a work permit. He wants you deported before you get that work permit. Because once people get a work permit, yeah. they, they can disseminate, because now they've got it in their hand, and they can disappear off the radar. Not many do that. Most people want their asylum, so they stay on the radar. But when you're in survival mode, the dynamic can change significantly. So people who've been waiting for the asylum interviews from 2016 are still waiting. But someone who signed up in April of 2019 is getting the interview right now. It's starting to because he doesn't it want to crazy. give them work permits and he wants them out. It so he's turned this whole thing upside down. What we're doing in our organization is we're part of the amicus briefs. We give testimony in court for asylum seekers. All of this is unpaid and we, ra we raise um, uh, crowdsource funding to try and feed people who, and give them safe shelter. Those people that were, that are on still, that situation that Layla was in, when she brought people to that room, that is going on right now. Right now in Uganda, we, we, are, we have two safe houses right now ourselves that we're putting people in, and it's just catch us as catch can. You know, HIAS is another good organization, but they're well-funded, and their staff are getting nice salaries, and, and, but they are providing stipends to some refugees, and then the stipends get cut off after a certain amount of months, and then those refugees come to us and say, Sahaya's can't pay us anymore, can you help us? And it's just scramble, 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 scramble. It's a mess, it's chaotic. We're trying, we're doing the best we can. The ultimate awareness and the ultimate thing, and I think your work is so tremendously valuable on two levels. And so you supporting her work is a big part of this and critical as well. What can you do? If you're supporting her work, that's awesome because she will make more work. And make more work is more visibility and getting into more places. You're going to be in Italy, right? Um, we'll be in Italy, uh, but I'm um, also taking a trip to Kakuma camp. I think we discussed about it. And uh, 
I was typically worried, what really worried me so much. Uh, when I got all these images and uh, they're telling me, Daddy, look at me, do you even know how breaststrokes here? I'm like, it's going to yeah. cost me only one piece right. to go down there right. and see how we can. I think I've discussed this yeah. with well, you. You and I need to talk more about this because about, it's a big update. And yeah. we're in talks right now with you and HCR about how to do it differently. Yeah. And so we uh, must work together to make that happen. And uh, also talk with Baji through Sion, yeah. Wilma, and uh, you're having a meeting with them on uh, the 20, 24th, it's going to be on a webinar where we, we have it, that there's, you know, they feel like they want to engage me in and I'm like, yes, I'm ready uh, at least. Well, before, I didn't have any money, even when I really, really wanted to help, but I don't have a lot of money, but I feel like I can give back a little that I have. So it's the same discussion that we're going to do, uh, basically about the worlds. So I'm going to take a trip down there to, no, and it changes every week. There's and see what I can do as yeah. a, as it's, it's artist. It's very so fluid. Yeah. yeah, it's very fluid there right now. And it's a very dangerous predicament right now because um, the, among the LGBT people themselves, there's a little bit of provocation in the sense that sometimes people think that they might get such a horrible place to be. One lesbian that I worked with said, I, I lost my soul in Kakuma. You know, yeah. um, it's, a, it, it's a terrible place to be. Uh, but there's a lot of resentment from the heterosexual community towards the LGBT community yeah. because they don't want to see LGBT people getting resettled quicker if they've been there for 17 years and haven't been resettled. But what they're not re realizing is that the LGBT community is having the same persecution within the camp that they had back home. So they, unlike the heterosexual community who were escaping war, they're not in a war zone when they but the LGBT communities in their same war so that, that is the difference. But it's hard to navigate, and it's hard to have people understanding, and it's very, very complex. The big danger, though, is if Kenya, who's in control of the refugees, not UNHCR, Kenya is charged with the protection, and as I said before, they're a hostile host because they criminalize the people that they are giving refugee status to. If we push things over the edge too much, with too much protest, Kenya's going to say bye bye. We they're going to throw, throw them out. And, and if and if Kenya <laughs> says and if Kenya <laughs> says <laughs> bye bye, then the gay people from Burundi, Rwanda, exactly. Tanzania, Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan, Uganda, who are relying on Kenya to register them as refugees, will have nowhere to go. So I think that. Um, if there's any other questions, great. But to answer your question, support the art, support her work, support organizations like African HRC, UNHCR, HIAS. Um, those are Budget prominent organizations. Or I don't know them. Who are Budget, they? Budget is uh, Black African Alliance. Oh, 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 right. Right. Okay. Is that the one where Sion is now? Yes, yes. yes. Working in yes. The, right now. the pronunciation, it's it's B A J I. J I S. Yeah. They're a good organization. They help asylum seekers. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions before we wrap up? Thank you so much. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Nicholas and Clava call him Ganda Angle, but the Kumuri Muano, he Mazoku call and does a movie they will never live with Zaka. I'm going to sign out about the Konga Mula Bolozum, Rubera Munji Munch. Maybe you've been a summer of Gera Zung. Mazoku Cola? That's it. Yeah, anyway, I'm going to sign out. Thank you for all those. I saw Sam Gordon has been on, and every other person who has been on. Thank you so much, and uh, that's it. Politics. So now we're going to get up politics. Bye and thank you so much. <laughs>